All right, EA Ermore, turn 78. Possibly all the skin shifters this turn. I think only half can actually get us this turn, so yeah, we'll see. All right, right, we're doing some mind hunts. Uh, this was successful. I think this is our own auger, if I'm recalling correctly, based off that name that we saw. And of course, we didn't get the, uh, the seducer, <laughs> great. So at least we uh, eliminated his spoils, uh, but we're kind of just hurting ourselves in a way. There's a report, of course, so yeah, an enormous blizzard. Nine units killed, an auger, right? This is our, our army that is pretty resistant uh, to murdering winter, and like, yeah, we, so the communion is gone now, uh, but we largely were not relying on the communion, and, you know, most of those augers were dying anyway, so that is fine. Uh, I am expecting, I think I mentioned, but there's a good chance he's going to switch uh, to the other nuke spell, Flames from the Sky, although that's going to be a lot less effective since most areas are cold. Uh, but it's definitely something that, you know, we, we need to think about, uh, because we have, especially like Liches, are uh, vulnerable to fire, right? So like anything that has fire vulnerability, uh, that could be a problem. And then let's see, yeah, we witness some battles, uh, we have an attack, and then we get attacked quite a bit. Uh, so let's take a look. I'm sure it'll all go fine. <laughs> this is a remote attack spell from Niflheim. Uh, and uh, okay, there's a good chunk of skin shifters here. And interesting, only a little bit of mage support and like no bless support, I don't think. So the, the skin shifters are still going to do fine, although this mage is perhaps, well, no, she's got enough kit. She'll probably be safe uh, from imps, but like, yeah, you know, they, they deal some damage, right? This is scary. She picks up an affliction. She lost an arm. Mostly not relevant, although, you know, I think skull staffs are uh, too two-handed. Let's, uh, did she have a skull staff? I actually missed that. Um, so possibly relevant, and certainly even if she didn't have a skull staff, uh, she can't, yeah, she did. So that actually is pretty relevant. Now, he may know there's no other commanders, so yeah, there's nobody that can even pick that up. So not sure why she's like off on her own. You know, Russ has been doing a really good job of uh, providing bodyguards and everything. And uh, but this is a magic phase attack, right? So Russ just may not have been expecting it. She does survive. She is twice born, right? So she'll come back if she dies. So not the end of the world uh, by any stretch, but that's still a really valuable hero for Russ. And, you know, losing that arm, losing the skull staff, that does hurt. And I think probably totally worth it uh, for Niflheim. And certainly we don't mind Russ's power being reduced, right? These are our raiders. And yeah, he didn't bother to PD dump. Probably why. Uh, considering it hasn't really been working out um, and so like yeah we're gonna we're gonna win that no losses hooray and then let's see we witness another battle where Niflheim again is attacking oh wait no sorry he's attacking Therados here uh, with a relatively small force so it looks like he has uh, a mound king right so it's just a death caster uh, they're not immortal so and they're pretty expensive to bring in their big thing is they can do reanimation so they can bring skeletons in on the strategic map uh, for free right like it just takes uh time takes turns uh, and the, most people feel like it's not like that it's not super efficient it takes a really long time for it to pay off and it's probably not worth it but you know as ever i haven't actually tested it a ton so who knows but i mean they're still a really powerful death caster and he's got two sacreds here who are not blessed right um but you know jaguar tribe not that great they're definitely not going to be able to stop all that so yeah a pretty efficient raiding force i would say from Niflheim, more or less i mean you know this is a lot of death gems to be risking so in that sense it's not great uh, but this is actually a bit of a a PD dump here so you know it's nice to eliminate all that gold which is something that Therados probably doesn't have a ton of uh, and then let's see Russ is attacking in Satis so Niflheim was sieging Satis so, okay yeah so it looks like this is where you know a good chunk of Russ's army has gone oh no it's in a swamp of course it being Satis and like yeah Niflheim actually has a, a serious force here uh, more units than he brings to a lot of fights uh, so a good chunk of his sacreds, right? A couple Jarls, a few casters, a couple uh, elemental royalty in there. So like, man, this, this is a real scary army. But <laughs> then again, so are the skin shifters. And I think, you know, nothing like too new from Russ from what we've seen. You know, uh, I wonder, if, is this guy a mercenary or is he? I think this, this might, I'll have to double check if this is the same mercenary. <laughs> it's very sad though, because I guess even the mercenaries, right, get hit by burden of time. Uh, so it's, it's just, it's a rough world to exist in right now if you're human. But yeah, let's take a look. Uh, we can see like Thunderfen, Serpent's Blessing coming down, right? So everybody's thrown on, right? This is the part of the game where you really don't know, oh boy, what's what's going to be coming. Uh, so, you know, the more that you prepare for, the better. <laughs> All right, we're, we're going to watch this super zoomed out for a little bit. Uh, Marble Warriors, right? A protection buff, weapons of sharpness. Okay, let's take a look at some of these globals coming up or... 
battlefield wide spells. Uh, so Wailing Winds from a Bone Reader, that's probably Russ, but since it's an independent mage, it could be Niflheim. Uh, Darkness, definitely coming from Niflheim. That will definitely matter uh, for the Skin Shifters, and it's actually something that we can do that probably I should have been doing. So we may, ha we may have to change up some of our scripts. Uh, so, you know, this is going to reduce the skills of anybody that can't see in the dark, uh, which Russ's Skin Shifters cannot. Foul Vapors coming from a Jade Priestess, another independent, probably Russ again. Uh, we haven't seen Jade Priestesses too much from Niflheim. And then Foul Vapors uh, coming from Niflheim. And of course, you know, that's the the battlefield-wide poison spell. Yeah, we're gonna have to zoom in now with darkness. We can't see anything. Um, okay, Firestorm. So of course, you know, we've tried the Foul Vapors play uh, and it did not work out for us. Russ has been pretty good about getting poison resistance. Yeah, so these guys have poison resistance. Not sure if he managed to get uh, the battlefield-wide one. Uh, probably, it looks like it. So I don't really expect that will do anything. Uh, Firestorm, probably, yeah, King of Magma. So that's definitely coming from Niflheim. Time. That is very intriguing. Let's go take a look at his kit real quick because this is something that you know we're thinking about doing and one of the things that we haven't tried to deploy. So wow, he just really he has pretty high magic resistance anyway. He has been given an amulet of anti-magic, right? Which is going to increase his magic resistance and actually uh, this also increases magic resistance. One of the few uh, helmets to do so. Normally you use this to increase your astral magic, but of course the King of Fire has no astral magic, so he's just using it for the magic resistance, but magic resistance 29 is is pretty high. You know, our pretender can get higher than that. Um, but still 29 is is pretty difficult to get around. That said, you know, there's going to be a a lot of damage uh, ticks, so there's going to be a lot of Blood Vengeance checks, and that's the main issue, right, with trying to use uh, Battlefield Wide Wipe against these Skin Shifters, and they actually do not have any fire resistance either. Their protection is decent. Let's see if they've, yeah, at least some of them have not gotten a protection buff. I suspect that at least a few of them got hit with Marble Warriors. Okay, wait, no, yeah, one of them must have gotten, that must have been a Marble Warriors fellow, uh, because this guy's protection is quite low. Although this guy got hit with fire resistance, so it looks like Russ still doesn't have like the battlefield-wide resistances uh, for everything. So like this could be pretty dangerous for Russ. Uh, and then we also have Howl coming out. Yeah, that's also coming from Niflheim. So you know, it's going to generate a bunch of wolves. Doesn't really combine well. Like this is a very hostile battlefield <laughs> for wolves. I don't. I'm not sure it's really going to help all that much. Yeah, you can see they just come in and they get poisoned. They get burned. There's like some blood vengeance coming out. Uh, let's see, and, and we don't really, we just keep an eye on if as soon as Firestorm goes down, then that means the King of Magma failed one of his uh, magic resistance checks. Although that said, he probably does have a lot of hit points. Yeah, that's one major advantage over our Pretender. Like, he's got 87 hit points and a Ring of Regeneration. I think this is going to work out for Niflheim. Um, and this is, like, sort of good news for us. I mean, obviously, you know, we've been having a lot of problems with these Skin Shifters and Russ in general, and they're currently our enemy. Uh, but in some ways, right, like, we need this to be really bloody for Niflheim <laughs> because, you know, as we discussed with the throne situation, there's a lot of reasons that we're next on the menu uh, for Niflheim. So... You know, we don't want them, this to go too well for them. And, like, yeah, Nivelheim's Sacreds uh, can operate pretty well in this really hostile environment. Um, they probably, yeah, they have fire resistance on the Bless, I think, and may have gotten a uh, so fire resistance. Yeah, so he get, probably got the battlefield-wide fire resistance. And with this level of protection and this amount of fire resistance, they can mostly ignore Firestorm. And then any of the damage that they don't ignore, they will just regenerate back up really quickly. Uh, so they're, they're immune to Firestorm, basically. Like, yeah, Nivelheim is really scary too um, and Russ is definitely at a disadvantage both being in a 2v1 uh, but also probably having significantly lower research um, I mean it's hard to say Russ has definitely surprised me a bit with uh, some of the research like I wasn't expecting them to have high evocation like they did uh, but we can see there's most of the skin shifters are in bear form and a lot of them are they're gone and I don't think they've really killed any of Niflheim's uh, sacreds you know maybe a few and I'm like, yeah, so it looks like maybe I should have uh, gone for the battlefield-wide uh, wipes sooner. Uh, there is a thug left, at least, and he might have gone berserk. Yeah, he's looking, you know, yeah, his morale failed. He fell asleep. He's almost dead. Uh, so, like, yeah, I would say that uh, Russ is in 
pretty big trouble now uh, and that we probably will be in pretty big trouble shortly. So let's take a look at what that costed everyone. So Russ loses almost everything. These are pretty significant. Their, their pretender does escape at least, um, but not much else. And like some of these are pretty significant. Yeah, so it was probably Russ that had the, that spell from the Bone Reader, right? Losing three of his slow to recruit cap onlys and, you know, losing 21 skin shifters. Like, yeah, this is all pretty significant. And Niflheim doesn't really lose too much, right? He loses two of his sacreds, one great eagle. None of that's a big deal. He does lose one add up to the Iron Order, or he was a foreign recruit, probably slow to recruit as well. Yeah, so that hurts a little bit, uh, but <laughs> to exchange it for all this from Russ, that's a great trade. So yeah, this kind of stuff is, you know, the reason that I've been worried about Niflheim all game long. You know, I knew that they, they're definitely capable of stuff like this, and this is some really good play. I think the main thing here is, like, Russ's research probably just isn't, you know, quite to the level that it needs to be, uh, and their resources aren't really quite to the level that they need to be. You know, hopefully we have caused some of those uh, resource issues. We haven't really seen too much of Niflheim's wars, especially recently, uh, so we don't really know how grindy they were. Uh, but definitely, you know, Russ has had some significant losses against us. And then speaking of significant losses, uh, here we are being attacked twice by Russ. I'm sure this will be fine. Uh, this is just some long dead horseman. I wonder if, no, this is probably not a remote attack spell. All <laughs> right, of course. Where are these guys even coming from? This is the same barbarian province that we just moved out of. Uh, we don't really have the money uh, to leave province defense, so there's, you know, no confusion about how that goes. Like, yeah, that was perfectly confident rating. I like it. Uh, well, you know, <laughs> I respect it. <laughs> it's perhaps better. And then, yeah, here's our battle, right? So Russ is taking, you know, two massive battles uh, in one turn. Very bold. And of course, you know, our army did get hit with Murdering Winter. This it was so, uh, and Augur did manage to survive. Uh, so we're, we are going to be lacking a little bit in some of our uh, casting. But, right, this is the force that came out of Helheim, and there's really almost no caster support here, just an Earth Reader he managed to get a hold of somehow from Agartha, and, like, yeah, we'll see what he does. Looks like there's going to be uh, some Marble Warriors coming down, which is a protection buff. I'm like, that's fine. Uh, but we still have, we have a lot of stuff here, so we'll see, right? We're up against a lot less uh, than what Niflheim was up against, so, you know, hopefully we can pull this off. It would definitely be a little embarrassing if we did not. So these are our fatigue plays, right? So we get Rigor Mortis uh, and Quagmire up, as well as Wailing Winds. Um, and so, yeah, but <laughs> Russ has embarrassed me before, so... <laughs> Uh, yeah, Army of Gold, I think. So we have our, whatever, our protection buff. Uh, that's possibly anti-magic or, I don't know, maybe it was astral healing. I think someone had some extra uh, astral pearls. Because, you know, we've seen how not having enough uh, gems before has caused a problem. So there's definitely some extra gems. Uh, our long dead horsemen are not going to do great, right? They don't love fire shield. They don't love the blood vengeance. They just, they don't have that much health. Uh, but they do have, you know, a lot of protection, right? So they are, you know, surviving better. Like, yeah. There's somebody that's already gone into bear form, bear form, right? And this is just kind of like our first wave. Uh, let's see, yeah, we have relief up uh, to help, right? Because a lot of our troops are living, right? The trolls and all that kind of stuff, the fire snakes who are just so slow. This has got to be related uh, to the temperature, yeah, and the swamp, right? So, of course, you know, we're hitting ourselves. I forgot about the swamp effect <laughs> of Quagmire, which slows down movement, um, which is good, right? Because we did want to kind of slow down the skin shifters, but of course, you know, we do suffer from it as well, but then also the fire snakes are getting hit because uh, they have firepower so you know fire snakes they don't love being summoned into a world that's turning into an ice ball they really don't appreciate that so they're probably not going to do a whole lot and like yeah we're losing our trolls and everything but you know we talked about how in a lot of ways this is going to help our money situation um, and yeah we're definitely getting a lot of hits and there's no regeneration or anything and most of Russ's sacreds like are asleep uh, so most of the casualties that we're taking are due to the blood vengeance and there's really just like no good way to get around that except possibly you know using like that the king of fire like a battlefield uh, wide wipe uh, with a really high magic resistance um, and it did seem like you know 29 was good enough certainly you know he survived the whole battle we didn't actually check he had a really high HP pool and regeneration so it may have been a case where you know he was taking damage uh, but then regenerating it back up so I'll probably take another look at that battle myself and see, you know, if if he was surviving hits or if he just wasn't taking any hits at all. Um, but that does work out for us. Definitely not without loss, right? Uh, so, you know, we kill 29 skin shifters and we lose all of our long dead horsemen. We lose, you know, our remainder of the devils, 
Um, we actually don't lose that many trolls, all things considered. So, like, yeah, trolls actually have like a fairly high magic resistance. So, you know, and when we put on, we we got our anti magic up. This, I'm pretty sure. I'll double check, but with losses this low, we surely got our anti magic up this time. Uh, so, trolls in some ways are kind of a, a good counter uh, to like a blood vengeance strategy because they have a decent hit point pool, they have regeneration built in, and they have a fairly high base magic resistance. And we also find a bunch of gear, right? So, you know. Not not without some pain, but it's pretty difficult, uh, you know, to not have a painful victory against these skin shifters. And like, yeah, feeling pretty good about this. Uh, glad that we didn't fail uh, when Niflheim didn't. And then speaking of problems, uh, you know, here's Fomoria attacking Vanheim. And uh, in the in the game chat, the Vanheim sub, oh boy, this is serious. But yeah, the, the Vanheim sub said that they are pretty much done. <laughs> so I guess we, we probably missed like a, a pretty major battle. Uh, maybe he managed to like gateway back all those Van Heers, his sacreds. And like, yeah, you know, speaking of trolls and long dead horsemen, <laughs> you can see the community is in somewhat agreement about what the best summons are. Uh, these mechanical men are also like pretty effective, kind of low hit points, but otherwise like a lot of really useful resistances and like decent stats um, and like yeah these living statues are also really nice really high like base protection um, and decent stats and like some physical damage resistances and then of course the ever-present corpse constructs uh, some a white mage like yeah this is probably wailing winds and yeah, this could be wailing winds wind of death uh, so like lots of gems lots of really high level casters some of their sacreds although I don't think they have a particularly powerful bless it seems like they've gone scales for Moria which I think is totally viable and but they definitely have some of these Fomorian kings and a lot of their non-sacred elven troops uh, which you definitely need a lot of money for and yeah they're not they're not up against a whole lot so it looks like they're the, the goddess is here um, and that is significant but there just isn't really enough like there's a few casters that's kind of interesting this guy's been empowered in fire that's not cheap in terms of fire gems uh, but like, yeah, there's uh, this. It's gonna be fast. Dance of the Morrigans. Uh, that is a national only spell from Fomoria. It's kind of like Howl, but instead of bringing in crappy wolves, it brings in like ridiculously powerful sacreds. Speaking of Howl, uh, also Howl, probably coming uh, from Fomoria. And uh, yeah, this is oh yeah, mass fight of course. Uh, so, yeah, a little bit of Phoenix Pyre there from one of Vanheim's, probably the Pretender, or actually maybe the one that's been empowered in fire. But you know, he's just he's gonna die too quick too quickly mass flight helps a lot with that uh, because you know when you resurrect from phoenix pyre you just end up in a random place on the map so if you guys have to walk over really slow then they get a, a chance to tick down their fatigue but if everybody's flying you don't really get that chance and i would say at this point there's a fairly good chance that we are going to become a battleground uh, between Fomoria and niflheim so like yeah this is not looking good for us and you know that's 338 units with a lot of scary like caster support uh, no real losses to speak of the Numidians hurts a little bit but I mean only four of them so and of course you know Vanheim loses what they have left this very well may be it like you know like, since the goddess was here and it's one of the few forts they have left so we might actually talk to Vanheim and see if you know they'll release us from their non from the non-aggression pact that we have and maybe try to pick up like Abyssia's capital and like maybe Arcocephaly's capital uh, uh, probably not on Arcocephaly, like the this is pretty close to that fort. Uh, so, but whatever we can pick up would be good. Uh, we definitely will antagonize Fomoria by doing that a bit. But on the other hand, like I just think that it's pretty likely that they're going to come after us anyway. So better to have more resources. Uh, we'll see. It's not like we really have a lot of resources to throw into that. So you know we may just have to accept whatever happens simply because that's you know where we're at. Of course, you know burden of time always. <laughs> People have revolted. We you know we took misfortune. We can't argue too much. Oh man, bogus. So yeah, you know, we, we get hit uh, with the visiting heroes. This is one of the caves. That's kind of sad because we we do want this for movement. Um, but you know, we should be able to get rid of this group fairly easily. Yeah, these fellows they, they do provide some gear uh, when you know when you manage to kill them. So it's not all bad news. Uh, and then of course, you know, this is still breach the fort that we failed to take that you know we're having to backtrack and waste a bunch of time on and some patrolling. And yeah, I'll see you guys after the jump. All right. This is the situation and what we're doing about it. A bit of an interesting turn, uh, just in the sense that it was 
gonna go one way it looked like and now has gone a completely different way so uh, you know when I first started looking at this turn I saw this <laughs> giant stack on our border from Fomoria and you know considering that he has this stack here which we saw in action and you know hadn't responded to me and I'd mentioned that I was you know losing my <laughs> war against Russ I was like okay this is like a pretty good chance right there's what a capital right here like this is probably coming for us so you know I should probably start preparing for that um, and I reached out uh, to the Vanheim sub and asked you know hey can can you release me from our non-aggression pact uh, because you know they'd mentioned in in the general chat that you know they were they were pretty much out uh, and they agreed uh, to release me so I figured like okay you know I should start to jump in and vulture this territory since there's a pretty good chance you know looking like we're gonna be fighting for Moria here but I figured, you know, also let's not jump to conclusions. So I, I did reach out to Fomoria. Wasn't really expecting, you know, I was kind of expecting silence, uh, which is often what you get, you know, when people are going to attack. Uh, and just asked him like, hey, you know, where's this giant stack on our on our border going? Uh, and he mentioned a couple locations. Like he's not sure yet, but he said definitely not me. Uh, which is, you know, like I said, not what I was expecting. Uh, and so, you know, Arco is one of the, you know, places that he mentioned he did not actually mention abyssia as like one of the listed locations uh so you know i mentioned to him that like oh well you know vanheim released me from the nap and you know i was thinking about jumping in and, and grabbing this uh, which i knew you know he would not be thrilled about uh, <laughs> his initial response was just hmm which i think is completely fair uh you know and then i pointed out like well you know it's it's pretty trashed and it's just fire gems and i need fire gems you know to try to get back uh, eternal pyre which, which is all true not that i mean everybody always has uses for gems uh but then you know he mentioned well if you need fire gems he actually has a bunch stacked up Fomoria doesn't actually have a ton of fire access so it makes sense you know it's kind of difficult for him to use fire gems and you know what they do have is a lot of air access <laughs> so I, I saw a well we'll see either a foolish move or a golden opportunity right so we had a bunch of air gems stacked up and you can see that we do not have very many air gems so I offered to trade uh, 50 air gems for 40 f uh, fire gems right which is a terrible trade definitely <laughs> uh, you know but I also said like you know I, I need a path basically to Abyssia right and Abyssia's capital <laughs> um, and he was you know very happy with that trade I think recognized that like yeah, air gems are, are more valuable and air gems are also especially useful useful uh, to Fomoria. Uh, and he said for that trade that uh, I could not only have Abyssia, but also the Cap Circle, uh, which is really nice because while, yeah, we do want fire gems, uh, you know, I am legitimately a little bit concerned. Fire elementals in the cold, you know, aren't going to do great. Um, but uh, hopefully there's some other gem types. Uh, I don't no, like I think Calum might actually be in Abyssia's cap circle, so we might not be able to grab everything. And he also said uh, any territory that Vanheim has uh, to the north of Abyssia. So, you know, that's quite a few provinces, um, and I think worth it, especially since like we, in the same way that he probably is struggling uh, to use fire gems, we're struggling, you know, to use the air gems that we had, like nine a turn, you know, we need like eight a turn to make eagles. And then, you know, we need a few for like fog warriors and a few air spells, which we can't really cast in battle anyway, because they require the use of communions that we can't really deploy. So yeah, I don't know, um, you know, maybe a foolish trade, but I don't know, it feel, feels good to me. And then also I think, you know, he's happy, I'm happy. Uh, he did mention that like, yeah, we'll probably need to like coalition uh, Niflheim in order to prevent their win, which I think is probably accurate, right? And considering, you know, I would much rather ally with Fomor right rather than be the battleground uh, between <laughs> Fomoria and Niflheim which is where I was concerned things were about to go uh, so we'll see you know we didn't agree to any non-aggression pact or anything like that I think especially in the late game I don't know I just I'm less inclined to move that direction uh, especially as you get into a situation where it's like well everybody's like big enough and dangerous dangerous enough uh and oftentimes like have enough thrones that you may things may shift really quickly and hopefully this will you know also demonstrate that like you don't really need a non-aggression pact uh if both people are happy you know with deals that have been made and you know you do some trading and the situation it's a an alliance of convenience right so it's like as long as Niflheim is a strong threat you don't really like need a non-aggression pact in order to work with someone the other possibility of course is that he's going to take you know the 
those uh, 50 air gems that I'm sending him and turn him into a bunch of air elementals that he uses to attack us with. I don't really get that sense. Um, and at the end of the day, a non-aggression pact is just a handshake agreement anyway. So, you know, people can discard that. There's really no safety in it. Uh, so we'll see. But, you know, it looks like we're going to be able to pick up a decent amount of territory on the relative cheap, uh, which is nice because we've been working hard for what we've been gaining for a lot of the game. And we could definitely use some uh, cheaper additions to our empire. And that's kind of what uh, all this movement is about. We're not super ready to be making these moves, but, you know, we've got like a legionary group, uh, some of our equite, a priest to bless them, a magic duel fellow just in case, uh, and then like a, an, an auger group that's going to, you know, uh, send out a fire elemental. And we will probably actually, you know, start to split some of this out. Uh, part of this is because, you know, we have to move uh, on Russ's border. So pretty much, you know, anything we raid out into Vanheim with, uh, he's going to have the opportunity where he's at least going to get a scout report on it and have the opportunity to hop on it and really just like move from his capital, right? Those skin shifters are pretty fast. So anything that we're using to, you know, raid and attack into Vanheim with, uh, we need to be concerned. It needs to also be able to potentially fight whatever Russ is going to throw at us. Uh, speaking of Russ, of course, the war is far from over. So I actually got, I thought he had raided us down in this barbarian province, but actually he raided us up here in this barbarian province. You know, yeah, we've been fighting over this astral pearl for some time. Maybe you shouldn't have pulled my raiders like all the way back, like left a group here to dissuade him from, you know, like a small raid like this. Uh, but yeah, I don't know. Anything that's not inside a fort and on his border is in danger of being jumped on and destroyed. So yeah. Anyway, we're going to move out uh, some stuff to counter any further raiding like yeah we have a magic duel fellow uh, and then we have this guy that's you know gonna make a fire elemental he's just a white mage he's really messed up so like risking him is not ideal but this is a guy who's been crippled so like yeah his map move is only like five you know he's not he's not a great white mage if we lose him it's not the end of the world some sea trolls and some infantry uh, I think this will be enough stuff right he just raided out with just some long dead horsemen so not that scary I think most of the skin shifters are dead. <laughs> Famous last words. Uh, so, you know, we saw a group of them die on top of uh, Satis here, right? And then there's a group of them here uh, on top of this throne, although they haven't cracked this fort. And we did see this group get attacked. This is the one with his hero, right, who had the skull staff and lost her arm. Uh, and then, he, you know, he has at least a few in his capital, and we can see that there's definitely still recruitment going on. So he's going to build up more skin shifters, definitely. But this is probably like one or maybe two turns of recruitment. So significant and scary, but not going to be enough in all likelihood to take out our capital, at least not for a few turns. Um, he did have a decent stack of chaff here which is probably still in place or, you know, maybe moving to reinforce this throne. Obviously, he split some of it off uh, to do this raiding. Um, and then this fort is no longer cracked. So, you know, possibly there was a storm, like a failed storm that we missed. We knew, you know, there was a fairly substantial stack of mages and units in here, but none of them were skin shifters, at least at the time. And then, of course, we, we killed, you know, a good stack of skin shifters on top of this fort. Uh, and then we're just going to storm with everything. We're not going to mess around. Like I said, I don't think there are any groups of skin shifters available to gateway around, right? Because especially this group, uh, you know, it, there's no lab here for them to use. They don't actually own this fort. So we know that this group, you know, cannot teleport uh, onto us you know, this turn from anywhere. So the only question is, you know, does he have somebody in his capital that can teleport out uh, whatever's there currently? And, you know, like that could definitely, if he has someone like that, it would definitely turn around if we try to do another budget attack. So I think it's just worth it kind of to take our time. I don't know. It'll probably be empty now. Well, it definitely won't be empty because <laughs> there's those unblessed skin shifters. So we're at least going to have to kill a few skin shifters. Uh, I think his god is not at home currently, but you don't always get full information about the mages. So that might not be true. Anyway, we're not going to risk it. Uh, so we're storming with everything. We should be able to take that. Uh, in terms of risks, we are taking a few. We're going to move uh, our eagles out. And like this is, you know, great siege strength. Actually, should probably 
holding this hack here, is, but they're not great in combat, right? They have no mage support, no nothing. So this is definitely the kind of force that is asking to be jumped on uh, by a thug. Uh, now that said, we will at least be able to move uh, our earth fellow here along with any uh, trolls that have the mountain survival, right? So we can provide at least like a protection buff for our eagles next turn. And he won't be able to magic phase onto the eagles immediately because it's his fort. So whenever you magic phase movement in a fort, you end up inside it. Uh, so we'll at least be able to provide a little bit of support. Uh, we do need to get moving, right? Because like while Niflheim is drawn off for now, like if we take our time, you know, they're interested in Helheim. Um, and, you know, they have, it looks like they're going to give it to us, uh, but we need to get rolling. And obviously they're very interested in thrones. Uh, the other thing is that, you know, we've set, uh, Ubar has gone to AI. And, you know, this was agreed upon. I think the player had more or less checked out. And unfortunately, like, they still have a decent amount of territory. You know, it's not the end of the world, but, like, you can see, like, immediately it's just, <laughs> AI gets a lot of cheats. Uh, and we do border them. You know, you can actually, the AI gives way too too much uh, deference to high province defense so like if we bump this up to like 30 or 40 we could probably guarantee that the AI wouldn't attack us uh, but then I mean who knows you know the AI is very difficult to predict other than that they don't like to go into really high levels of province defense um, so they might attack Niflheim they might jump onto Helheim if they jump onto Helheim like obviously we need Helheim so we're probably gonna end up fighting the AI anyway and I just I don't, it's not a useful use of our money. Um, now that said, I mean, this is enough seed strength that like we don't really have a ton in this fort. So like, yeah, it could get kind of ugly. Like maybe we should cut some major recruitment to make sure the AI doesn't come in on us. Um, but I mean, it's kind of like, well, you know, they could go other places anyway. We'll cross that bridge if we come to it. Uh, but somebody is going to need to sit on top of AI Ubar uh, to prevent just these massive stacks from getting barfed out like every turn. I'm assuming that'll be Niflheim, uh, but you know, maybe they're more busy uh, with Theridos than, you know, I gave credit for because uh, I would have expected them. I mean, this is a capital. I don't know what kind of shape it's in. Probably not great shape, but still, that's a lot of gem income. I don't know if we can see, yeah, we can't actually see the gem site, but there's a lot of gem income in there. And then, of course, you know, we've talked about how this is a throne that probably Niflheim is interested in and a relatively easy pickup. So I'm kind of surprised that they haven't moved in. Um, you know, like, yeah, I don't know, maybe they have some stuff on the border. Like, there was a stack of giants down here. You know, this is only a few. And there was a pretty large stack of giants, so I'm assuming it's just somewhere where we can't see right now. Anyway, we're probably going to have to fight AI Ubar, possibly to defend our own territory, possibly, you know, over Helheim. So it's, it's fine, like, our army will be able to crush it, um, but you know, this is enough stuff that we have to give it respect like we can't you know raid against it and things like that otherwise again it doesn't really look like russ you know has much up here we've discussed at length about yeah once we kill the skin shifters then it was the soft underbelly <laughs> so <laughs> we're hoping we're in the soft underbelly phase uh we're doing like just a few swarm raids here and here this is where uh that province rebelled uh, and then we're we're shifting a lot of stuff like off of Fomoria's border um a lot of it is coming you know north to attack into abyssia and capture the agreed upon territory or sorry, into Vanheim that is in Abyssia's territory. And then we'll also want to shift some stuff over, right, to help defend this throne. And then eventually we did not lay any specific plans. Fomoria just kind of mentioned in passing that we'd probably need to coalition to fight Niflheim. Uh, but I do think that's true, and I do think that Niflheim is probably in the number one position. So probably going to start moving things, you know, more on our border. Like I said, we'd, we would want to launch like a lot of legionary attacks, uh, like on a wide front uh, to kind of help spread the pain out and pick up as much gem income as possible and enforce a lot of responses. But we ideally also do not want to lead that charge. Um, so, you know, really we kind of want to more dig in. We might actually upgrade this fort so we can start getting more augers out of it. Um, things like that, right? Just like dig in along this border and get it a little more defended since we had to strip most of those defenses to fight against Russ. And then of course, like, you know, this is Russ's capital. There's still going to be skin shifters pouring out of here. Uh, Russ is a really good player. They have plenty of gem income. They have a global, right? Eternal pyre. So like, they're not done. They're not done by a long shot. Um, and so we obviously, we also really need to defend like our Northern territory here. Uh, and then as a final consideration, you know, I didn't really consider this throne, right? As one of the ones that Niflheim could pick up. Uh, but you know, if they are able to beat up Russ really effectively and like, you know, we've really struggled to try to take Russ's capital. Um, and I wasn't really planning on going after it again. And I may still not. 
Uh, but yeah, this is another throne, right, that Niflheim could grab you know, to potentially win. So we may exert ourselves, you know, to try to grab that throne, and that'll probably like end relations uh, with Niflheim. But we're we're kind of reaching that part of the game, so that would be as good reason as any to go to war. Uh, but we also don't want to press too hard for it because you know, again, we're going to try to pick up this less defended territory. We may also try to snap up, you know, a little bit, especially if Calum has some of Abyssia's cap circle. You know, we want that uh, that'll also position us like next to this throne so if Fomoria does decide that Kalem is next on the chopping block we'll ideally just try to pick up like one like the, maybe these two provinces maybe this one if Kalem has it just a little bit of vulturing enough that it's not going to annoy Fomoria too much we'll certainly you know let them have uh, this throne and I mean we can't really do anything about this throne down here uh, so, you know, we're going to, you know, absolutely Fomoria will get the lion's share of that. But, you know, if we can at least position ourselves so that we have easy access, like, to the throne, that's always nice, right? If you can be next door to a throne, that helps a lot in terms of, like, actually trying to win the game. Uh, which I still don't think is likely, but um, is maybe more possible, right? Like, if Fomoria... Uh, attacks Niflheim and you know we're able to make some gains like we don't actually have like terrible throne position right we have a throne already ideally we have a second throne here this could be a third throne like a fourth throne so like do I think it's likely that we win no but you know we're still you know always interested in that uh, and then in terms of recruitment you know mostly major recruitment a mix of like augers and <laughs> auger elders you know we've, we've talked at length about issues there uh, we're probably actually just going to be recruiting these uh, horticulturalists for the rest of the game. Uh, part of it is like they have the high max age, <laughs> which is really nice with burden of time. And like N1 isn't super useful, but they are stealthy. Uh, so we, we might actually try to like sneak a bunch of these guys out into Niflheim's territory and like do like some pretty deep like swarm raiding and a limited like elfing. And then, you know, we do uh, some extra earth mages and water mages would be really nice. And, you know, as you can see, it's not uh, very common that they get those paths. I think it's like a 20% random. Um, it's at least like common enough that, you know, if we pump a bunch of these guys out, um, like we'll, we'll get some other useful mages. They're not going to be useful in our main stacks because uh, they just have such low HP. So, you know, they're going to die to Murdering Winter and Flames from the Sky in a lot of ways even worse than our human mages. So in that sense, they're not great, but they're not going to die from old age and disease, which is a big upside. So, you know, I don't know, whatever. We're, we're going to make them out of this fort because, like, we have enough augers and auger elders coming from other places. So that's probably the only major shift in recruitment. I'm not really recruiting any legionary infantry like I threatened. Uh, I think it's probably a little too early uh, since, you know, we have at least three turns uh, with a non-aggression pact for Niflheim um, and I'm not really looking to tangle with him immediately uh, and then of course eventually not too distant future we'll have cataclysm so we may not even get time to fight like a really major war or we might be in the middle of a war with Niflheim when cataclysm arrives I guess we are doing a little bit of recruitment here really just kind of more as like siege strength uh, so that Niflheim isn't able to immediately crack this fort uh, we should probably also upgrade this into a castle again just for some additional wall strength uh, and then I am recruiting uh, Equite the Sacred Shroud yeah I mean th this is definitely very questionable uh, like I said we're, we're probably going to use them as heavy raiders because uh, they can't really survive the nuke spells so we can't really have them in our main stacks although at various points you know if we're under domes or something like that or you know maybe move them into a battle where we're expecting so it's like okay we're gonna get nuked this turn on our main army and then we can have some equity groups moving in to assist where we're expecting a battle and since magic phase happens before movement you know the army that's there that can hopefully withstand it will survive it and then the equity will move in and join with the the battle they are still you know really effective you know units some of the best units that we can recruit with gold so you know i don't know i don't hate it i love sacred cavalry and equity the sacred shroud so i'm not saying it's defendable but it's what we're doing uh, we're also going to bring in some terracotta uh soldiers so you know they're going to be useful uh as bodyguards uh, for our auger like raiding groups with the fire elementals and you know we've seen how the human troops have a tendency to get killed when the augers start like spamming out fire evocations uh, so you know we're gonna spend some of our fire gems on that and then we're gonna bring in some more eagles like a second great eagle stack especially to try to break uh, Abyssia 
would be really nice. And then I guess our death gems are going into a lich down here. Like, yeah, I just kind of like to spread out my immortal summoning a bit. So yeah, things are starting to look a little more up. You know, like I said, I, I think it's still pretty unlikely that we win this game. And, you know, once Niflheim is finished with Rust, there's a pretty good chance they come at us hard. Uh, but, you know, we might actually have like a fairly powerful ally. I did actually reach out uh, to Jabalba. I haven't heard back yet. Um, and, you know, I didn't commit to anything, which is good. Uh, I just was like, hey, you know, you border Niflheim and Fomoria, uh, who potentially could be my enemies shortly. Like, you know, what are your thoughts? What are your plans? What's going on over there, bat people? Uh, but, you know, I wasn't like, hey, you should attack, like, Fomoria's undefended side. Because, uh, yeah, it's always good to you just kind of leave things vague as long as possible. Because uh, for all I know, right, Jabalba and Fomoria could be working really closely together, right? And then Jabalba's like, hey, like, Ermor is talking about backstabbing you. <laughs> and then all these agreements uh, could go up in smoke. Uh, so we'll see. You know, we'll see what Jabalba's plans are, like how invested they are in the game. But potentially, like, we could have Jabalba attacking Niflheim. I don't even think Fomoria has much of a border yeah they you know they will border Niflheim like they do border here obviously but through Russ's old lands or current lands again like really should not count Russ out it is looking a bit dire for them but you know yeah <laughs> they've surprised me many times before so I expect there will be more surprises in store uh, but assuming that they do go down then Fomoria and Niflheim will share like a fairly substantial border here um, and then also, like once they finish uh, taking, you know, Nef uh, sorry, Vanheim's stuff up here, they'll share a small border like along this coast. So currently, Fomoria actually doesn't really have a good way to fight with Niflheim, um, but I think within the next, you know, 10, 15 turns, they probably will start to share a relatively large border. So it's like we potentially have Fomoria attack, uh, myself attack, uh, and Jabalba attack, uh, which would, you know, be completely unfair, but <laughs> such is the way of Dominions. Uh, not forgetting, of course, that, you know, Therados is still fighting uh, Niflheim. So while Niflheim is an excellent player and in a good position, uh, you know, that's that's a lot of stuff to be fighting, right? A lot of nations to be fighting and a, a lot of fronts to juggle. Uh, so I think there's actually a decent chance, assuming everybody's interest is maintained in the game uh, that it'll come down to uh, Cataclysm and we'll kind of get to see how that plays out you know and we'll have a giant war uh, basically during the middle of the apocalypse so that should be interesting and uh, yeah I think that covers turn 78.